And welcome, Hoosier fans, to another victorious episode of the Assembly Call. As tonight we rewatch your number one seed, Indiana Hoosiers, defeat the number one seed in the West Region in UNLV at, by a 97 to 93 final score to earn a spot in the NCAA championship game against Syracuse on Monday night. The victory moves the Hoosiers to 29 and four on the season as they snapped UNLV's 22 game winning streak and gave the Rebels just their second loss of the season. This will mark Indiana's fifth trip to the NCAA championship with the Hoosiers winning all four of their previous appearances. Uh, as I mentioned before, the Hoosiers will face the Syracuse Orangemen after they knocked off Providence in the first game of today's Final Four. And uh, we'll uh, talk about that a bit later. But uh, for right now, I'm your host, Andy Bottoms, here with one of my regular co-hosts on the Assembly Call, Ryan Phillips, as well as Galen Clavio from Crimson Cast. And we'll break it all down for you on this edition of the Assembly Call IU Post Show. And let's start this show the way we start every show, and that is with our banner moment. Uh, a number of moments you could pick from this game, but I guess since we typically look at when the game was maybe sealed and in doubt and in the play that gave uh, IU the chance to hang another banner, uh, to me it was the Steve Isle layup at the very end of the game. Uh, Isle played a pivotal role in the first half uh, in relief of Daryl Thomas, who picked three early fouls. Isle had a number of great plays in the first half and uh, largely gave it to fellow reserve Joe Hillman in the second half, but uh, Isle had a, a big layup after a missed three from UNLV, got a run out and an and one, uh, that really put the final nail in the coffin, put IU up uh, 97 to 88 or 89, I believe. Um, or I think it was 88. Uh, UNLV would get a th another three and a put back to, to close the final margin to four points. But a really big play from Steve Isle. And on a night when IU didn't turn to its bench often, uh, the two guys who played the bulk of the minutes off the bench uh, were absolutely huge in propelling IU to the national championship game uh, on Monday night. So for me, the banner moment in in specific is uh, the play by style, but in general is a real to the play of both Isle and Joe Hillman over the course of the game that those guys uh, had, had a number of fantastic moments that I'm sure we'll get to as we move through the rest of the show. Our banner moment tonight, as always, is brought to you by our friends at Homefield Apparel, a company that was founded by an IU grad and remains based in Indianapolis. They may have 60 plus different schools available on their website, but IU was their firm, and they remain huge supporters of IU athletics. So that's one reason to support Homefield Apparel, but the two most important reasons to support them are one, comfort. Uh, the garments are tremendous. Even after you wash them a number of times, which you'll end up doing because you want to wear them all the time, uh, always comfortable to be in, whether it's a t-shirt or a hoodie, uh, will get you there for every uh, kind of weather. And they're unique. You've got logos you can't find anywhere, whether those are logos uh, from IU from the past. They rolled out a football series. There's a lot of cool old basketball designs out there as well, uh, or even other schools that you may not know as much about. Uh, they've gone in the archives to find some really cool designs from them as well. And so remember, because you're a member of the Assembly Call audience, you get a massive discount when you order at homefieldapparel.com. Use the promo code ASSEMBLY20 at checkout to get 20% off your entire order. That's ASSEMBLY20 for 20% off your order. So go to homefieldapparel.com today and get the most unique and comfortable IU apparel anywhere. All right, now it's time to move the ball, find the open man, and get some opening thoughts from the rest of our team. And uh, we'll start this one off with uh, Ryan Phillips. Ryan, uh, probably not a lot to rant about as you uh, as you might normally have, uh, given the way IU played tonight. Uh, so uh, give us uh, your uh, thoughts on the game. I I'm just going to agree with you. I thought the bench play was really key for India, especially with some early foul trouble with for Daryl Thomas. Um, you got Steve Isle come in and play 20 minutes and just play really good basketball. He didn't light up the scoreboard. He didn't come in and dump 20 points in or anything like that. He just played really solid basketball. I think you can say the same about Joe Hillman, who came in and was steady when Keith Smart sat a lot in the uh, later half of the game. I thought Smart started off the game really well and being aggressive and attacking the hoop, and I thought that really helped Indiana kind of get into the game, especially as Steve Alford was having a slow start to the game. Smart was attacking the rim. He was working, you know, inside and – and really, he was a kind of guy, and they mentioned on the broadcast, who could match up with UNLV as far as the speed and athleticism of the game. And he really took advantage of that and attacked. I thought he and Dean Garrett were the key in the first half to keeping kind of IU hanging around and, and, and building that lead that they built just with consistent, smart play. And then I thought Hillman really almost was the closer in the second half in that spot because Keith Smart only played 23 minutes and Hillman played 17 
Hillman in the second half was really the guy who just steadied everybody, allowed Steve Offer to play off the ball and go through all those screens that they kept diagramming on, on the broadcast and, and get open and, and really helped it so that Alford didn't have to worry about bringing the ball up, didn't have to worry about guarding the best defensive player on UNLV and could focus on his offense. And that's how he dropped 33 points. I, I So I think that those two guys had such an impact on this game, especially considering that IU is a team that doesn't have a deep bench and UNLV was supposed to have a good bench. Well, I thought IU's bench won the game for them today by continuing to just sort of, you know, keep the game going, keep the momentum going. You saw some some short bursts from UNLV, but I really thought the bench was able to sort of, those two guys specifically were able to kind of just steady the game when IU needed it the most. So I think those guys deserve a ton of credit for the win. And, and Galen, I appreciate you uh, not staying on to watch that IHSAA game and uh, hopping on the postgame show with us. So that is certainly appreciated. Uh, so while you are wondering what's what's going on in that Marion Richmond game, uh, maybe give us some some thoughts and, and lasting impressions that you took away from this IU performance. I don't know, man. I mean, they got these two kids that look awesome. They're coming to IU next year, Jay Edwards, Lyndon Jones. I mean, you know, possible co-mister basketballs. It's 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 really exciting. But no, uh, look, I think the thing that stands out to me in this game is two things. One, um, this UNLV team was ranked number one essentially all year. And for good reason. I mean, this is a an athletic team it's a team that forces you to play an entirely different system than you're normally used to playing it's a team that plays incredibly tenacious defense and IU was just completely unfazed by them I mean you would have thought that they were playing Wisconsin in like a, a Wednesday game in January and you know we haven't lost to Wisconsin in like nine years at this point so you know just to just just they, they looked unscared and I think that you look at a lot of the teams that have played UNLV this year and they've looked scared and you know, it kind of, this goes hand in hand with that. But one of the things right off the bat that Brent Musburger and Billy Packer talked about at the beginning of the broadcast was the good defense that this UNLV team plays. And we keep hearing that over and over again. IU scored 97 points on 63% shooting with only four three pointers taken and they only hit two of them. I mean, this was a defensive evisceration and so IU scored 97 points with 14 turnovers. I mean, just, just an incredible offensive performance, probably the best offensive performance we've seen from this IU team, maybe all season. I mean, there's a couple of games in the Big Ten against lesser opponents. But on this stage, this is, you know, th this is really a tremendous, tremendous accomplishment for this particular group of players. Uh, and particularly, you know, you lose one of your senior leaders early on in the game. And he really is never the same after that. Daryl Thomas, like never really fully got integrated back into the contest to be able to sustain that and still put up that kind of an offensive performance, uh, I think is, is just a testament to Bob Knight's ability to, to keep his team in a groove and to, you know, the, the way that the offense just manufactures shots for the right people over and over and over again. So it was, it was really heartening to see. I think a lot of people, they've been looking at this game. They've been looking at IU and saying, you know, does Knight still have it? It's been, you know, six years since the last national title. Uh, you know, is this really a situation where, you know, the IU with its supposed lack of athleticism can keep up with a team like UNLV? No problems at all. Yeah. It's interesting that you talk about that. That was one of the first things I wanted to mention. Uh, there were a couple of stretches really at the start of each half where IU struggled with turnovers, but in general, they didn't, you know, Billy Packer said this before the game, you know, that IU probably would want to slow the game down if, if they could. And and IU really came out and did anything but uh, try to slow the game down. And that was uh, a, a really key point in the game. They let multiple players bring the ball up the floor and really were just in attack mode. There were uh, multiple possessions when guys would back to the bucket early. Uh, Alford a big three off of a screen early in the possession uh, in the first half. And they really early in the game they tried to slow it down a bit at the end but early in the game really tried to run with you and all which i think caught uh caught the rebels a little bit off guard uh you know galen you, you alluded to that were you as shocked as i was to see them come out and and have that game plan uh, against a team like unlv yeah to some degree maybe not as shocked we've seen this iu team play fast and and play high scoring games against other teams this year they did it against iowa a couple of times they lost one they won one uh, there have been a couple other games where they put a, a decent number of points on the board. That seems to be the conventional wisdom that, oh, you know, Knight wants to play a slow down game. Knight's, but that's never been the case. Like I, I, I keep getting 
confused when I hear this in the press that, oh, Knight needs to slow down UNLV. Uh, we've seen IU shift into overdrive when they need to offensively in the past. And I think that this was the right move. I don't know that you can necessarily slow down UNLV, um, you know, because ultimately when you try to slow down your opponent, you leave yourself susceptible to fast breaks because you're, you're trying to play a more deliberate offensive set. And I think that Knight knew if he could keep uh, the flow of the offense in a way that he's going to trail guys back and try to cut off a fast break when UNLV is trying to spring it, if he can keep them running, he's going to bank on the idea that UNLV isn't going to be able to hit as many shots as IU because it, because UNLV isn't going to have as good of an offense as IU. So I think, yeah, it's a bit of a dice roll. And Knight himself mentioned in the postgame interview with uh, with Packer and Musburger that he was worried his team was going to run out of gas in the last 10 minutes of the game. And I think that was a real concern. Uh, and this is – it's kind of perverse because I think that Daryl Thomas getting into foul trouble early might have helped avoid that because it meant that they had to go seven deep as Spread opposed the to minutes we, around. Yeah, I mean, as opposed to what we've seen earlier on in the season where they've they generally almost – just gone six deep and that's it so uh it's it's weird how it all worked out but i wasn't as shocked as some of the experts were that they decided to run with them yeah if you look at it this team went into the 80s and 90s a lot this season you know a lot it's not like it's just a few times and when even went over 100 against wisconsin i mean this is a team that is uh, i mean i don't know if that's where they're comfortable playing with quotes around it but that's where they've played and so unlv a running team that puts up a lot of points I mean, it, this isn't just about Indiana running with UNLV. It's also about UNLV attempting to stop Indiana's ability to score. And you look at, you know, the shooting percentage tonight and and Indiana, you know, shot incredibly well for the game. And uh, I'm not sure what the final percentage wound up being, but you had a bunch of guys, 70%, 60%, 70%, 60%, 70% from two. And they only shot, as, as, as Galen mentioned, only shot four threes and they were all by Steve Alford and he made two of them. Uh, this was a team that can score and can shoot the ball. And you look at a guy like Dean Garrett can score pretty much from anywhere, 10 feet and in, I mean, he, he, he was taking jump shots. He was all over the place, but they were also getting layups. I mean, Callaway had a bunch of big layups in the second half and you had Daryl Thomas getting second chance uh, points at the rim. This is a team that can put points on the board with anybody. So the idea that they're just going to get run out of the gym by UNLV, UNLV, might have this high octane offense, which it does, but Indiana also has the ability to put a ton of points on the board. And so to me going into this game, it was more about UNLV's defense because their defense is exists almost entirely to create offense on the other end. And so, you know, that was the real key because Indiana runs such a structured offense, uh, motion offense to get Steve all for the ball and good looks to get, you know, Dean Garrett, the ball at the hoop to allow driving lanes for guys like Keith smart. So it was really to me about whether or not UNLV could stop Indiana and then get out and run as opposed to just getting out and running and hoping they wore out Indiana. That was as Galen said, a possibility, but I think that you're right. The foul trouble early, the, the going to the bench, bringing in a guy like Isle, seeing Hillman on the floor a little bit, you know, that, really gave Indiana on the back end some more minutes that they could spread around and, and, and potentially have some guy fresh guys fresh down the stretch. Yeah. So the other, I guess, strategy based thing that I wanted to touch on before we, uh, before we hit at least one of the individual players uh, that I wanted to talk about here was, you know, if you look at the box score, Gilliam ends up with 32 for UNLV and Freddie Banks ends up with 38. That's 70 points. Nobody else on UNLV scored more than six. And for large stretches of the game, IU wasn't even actively guarding uh, at least two UNLV players on any given possession. They really laid off of Mark Wade, dared him to shoot. and Despite the fact that he was not closely guarded, still managed to dish out a, a Final Four record 18 assists that was in crazy. the game. But made just one shot, uh, which I think was was very late in the game uh, and really and really had Alford just staying in the, in the lane to try to double-team Gilliam. So... So, Galen, what what stood out to you about IU's defensive strategy? Was it just a, hey, we're going to let these two guys get theirs and try to shut down everybody else? Or is that just kind of the way that the the flow of the game played out with who was making shots? Because other guys were taking shots. Uh, yeah. Gerald Patio almost threw a couple through the backboard uh, at one point. And really, every time he shot the ball, took off r sprinting toward the basket as if it was going to miss, which became a pretty high percentage play but um you know d defensively what did what did you see from IU and and how do you think that led to some of the success that they had in the game all, all, despite the fact that they gave up 93 points 
Well, I think for IU, for for a long period of time in that first half, it was essentially, well, we're just, we're essentially just going to outscore these guys because they're just not that good shooting wise on the seat. You know, and they haven't been necessarily great on the season. And I think, you know, when you, when you really dig into the, um, you know, the overall numbers of this team, I mean, they shot under 50% from the field on the year and they've, you know, they didn't play that tough of a schedule. They had some decent non-conference opponents, but they've been in the PCAA, uh, which is not a great conference all season. And, you know, I, I just think that Knight looked at this and said, you know, what really matters is the the final tally. It doesn't necessarily matter who scores the points for UNLV. Uh, and, you know, I thought it was interesting that, you know, they, they didn't guard the primary distributor in Wade and they didn't really care that much about Gilliam. Um, you know, the three point shots that Freddie Banks was taking, this is still a relatively new shot in the game. And I think Knight figured, well, if he really wants to throw up 19 threes, let him. What are the chances that more than half of those are going to go in? Of course, more than half of them ended up going in. Uh, and, and honestly, I was starting to have some second thoughts about Knight's approach to this game with about 14 minutes left in the second half, because at that point, UNLV had come back. They'd taken a lead. IU was starting to throw the ball over, or, you, know, th- you know, away. And y- you worried at that point that if UNLV could really clamp down defensively, uh, you know, they were going to be able to score just enough that IU wasn't going to get back in. But at the end of the day, I just think UNLV, they survive on pressure defense, which IU knows how to break, and they survive on athleticism, and IU knows how to deal with that. They deal with athletic teams all the time in the Big Ten, and I think most of UNLV's opponents don't know how to deal with that. They almost lost to Iowa. They were down 19 to Iowa last week, uh, you know, and, and Iowa foolishly just tried to press and press and press down the stretch, and UNLV figured out a way to score despite that. IU doesn't play that way. They made UNLV play in the half court in the second half, and that's ultimately, I think, what defensively allowed IU to win the game. Well, I think it's also worth noting, I mean, how many offensive rebounds there were for both teams. That was the majority of the offense that it felt like for long stretches of game that UNLV was getting. I mean, Gilliam had seven by himself in the game. But then you had, you know, guys with seven, four, two, 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 four. Like, you know, there's a lot of offensive rebounds and chances to be had. I felt like, you know, with UNLV shooting so poorly from distance, except for Freddie Banks, who got hot. What was it about late in the first half? He started to get hot and he wound up hitting 10 of 19. Um, But I felt like that was the way they were generating offense. And, And the reason why is. Indiana really was laying off of guys. And when you do that, you tend to give up offensive rebounds, you know, because as soon as the shots up, those guys don't have a guy right there to block them out. And Wade didn't get a ton, but it felt like they were, you know, he wound up with four rebounds and and two offensive rebounds, but it felt like as soon as somebody had to locate him to block him out, you're leaving other guys. And, and look, I mean, UNLV is a very athletic team. So that was the only downside to the defensive strategy, but I thought it was interesting that look, you can say they let Gilliam get his own. I just think he's good enough to go get his own, no matter what you throw at him. Um, And, and banks obviously had a high, you know, total because he hit 10 threes. I mean, he hit 10 threes, that's 30 points right there. Um, So I felt like he was 10 for 23 overall and 10 of 19 or 12 for 23 and then 10 of 19 from three. I, I think that he just got his points because he started shooting shots from all angles and guys would give him an inch and he just got hot and started knocking down shots. So I think Indiana's defensive strategy was better than maybe the result looks out. If you look at, they gave up 93 points. Um, I just think that when you have a guy get hot and drop in 30 from behind the, beyond the arc, it's going to look a little different than what your strategy actually was. I think the real concern there was the offensive rebounds. And I think that's something they're going to have to shore up as they go play Syracuse in the championship game. Yeah, the offensive rebounds were were troubling. Some of that is all the threes that UNLV took, leading to some long For rebounds. Sure. Um, was there? But yeah, I just, I just thought the the decision to basically play the Wade's man in the middle of the lane, pretty much regardless of what was going on, to be an interesting one. And 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 Packer made a comment that maybe that wasn't the best thing to do in the second half because he had too much room to to pass. But given his statement early in the you know before the game about IU not wanting to run with them, uh, I think by that point his opinion had been called into question. But uh, <laughs> it was like a reverse box and one, you know. It was, yeah, it, was a very it really odd, was. It was a very odd. <laughs> yeah, approach, it was basically. But- five guarding four and then there's another guy out there <laughs> you know like i mean that's essentially but what we, it was we we see we've seen knight get a lot more 
liberal with what he's willing to do defensively as opposed to just straight up help man to man. I mean, he's earlier in this year, uh, they, they play Notre Dame and they go to a zone of all things because David Rivers. Blasphemy. I know it was crazy. Uh, you know, you know, it was, it was, it was one of those things that I don't think anybody thought was possible, but Knight has been known or becoming known to adapt just a little bit when he sees an opportunity. I think with Wade, he thought to himself, well, um, you know, is it really going to be worth it to, to take somebody away? Now, you could argue that it didn't make that much of a difference because IU, as you mentioned, Ryan, they gave up 21 offensive rebounds in this game. They, they let their opponent score 93 points, and yet they won by four. So at the end of the day, it works. Uh, who knows if they had played a more straight-up man-to-man, if that might have yielded a, you know, a, a larger win total or a larger win margin. It's hard to say. Yeah, and the one thing I'll say with Gilliam, he had 26. um, I mean, if they would put the time up more regularly on these games, I would have known exactly the time. But probably with about 12 to 14 minutes left, he had had 26. So he only scored six the rest of the game. I do think he was a guy that looked uh, a little bit fatigued at various times. And, And that leads me to the one player that before we take a break, I wanted to talk about, and that was Dean Garrett. Um, his, his performance on a number of levels was really important for IU. Uh, the numbers themselves are, are really strong with 18 points and 11 rebounds, a couple blocks. Uh, but the big number for him was two fouls. And in a game where there were 49 fouls called across both teams, he was the one, he was maybe not the one guy, but he was one of the guys that IU could not afford to get in foul trouble. And when basically everybody in the first half ended up with two fouls, he picked up his only first half foul really late uh and then in the beginning of the second half when IU was really struggling it was really Garrett and Alford that that pulled IU through he had a putback uh even even a play in the in the first half where UNLV had gone on a bit of a run Alford's waiting at the scorers table to come in uh Garrett hit a big 10-foot jumper to, to stem the tide he just made a number of really uh timely plays uh if nothing else and you know, you look forward to the matchup against Syracuse on Monday night. They've got Ronnie Cycli. They've got uh, the freshman and Derek Coleman to, to account for. So Garrett will be, you know, a guy they really need to step up big in that game as well. Um, but, but Ryan, I, we, you know, we will certainly talk about Steve Alford and his, you know, 33 points in the game were, were really impressive. Uh, but I thought Garrett's performance, uh, just like I said, in the timeliness of some of his plays and, um, and and being able to make Gilliam work on both ends was really, really important for IU. Yeah, and I think he established himself early, too. I think I thought it was he and Smart really early that kind of got things started for Indiana when Alford was sort of struggling and figuring out what UNLV was doing against him defensively. And then I thought in the second half, I thought you were right. I thought he helped close the show just by being strong in there. Uh, he made four out of his five free throws as well. I mean, and a lot of them timely. Um, 11 rebounds, four offensive boards to keep some plays alive and, and finish at the rim. And I think that he had a tough assignment with Gilliam and he was able to just at least, I mean, he didn't play him to a standstill. Gilliam obviously scored more and all that, but he get, you're right. He get, he occupied him and, and kept him busy on both ends and, and probably wore him down as, as UNLV looked very tired at the end of the game. And I think that a telling sign of, of how well he played, even, you know, he had 18 points were offered at 33. Uh, who did Bob Knight grab for the post game interview? He grabbed Dean Garrett for the post game interview. And I think that that's, that's indicative of like, how when the coaching staff thinks you had a great game and wants you to be the guy to get the credit for it, they pull you out for that. And, and, and the fact that we saw it and the fact that Knight saw it, 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 it says something. I mean, that guy was vitally important and he and Rick Calloway played 40 minutes. I mean, they both were out there the entire game uh, offered at 37. And, and so those three guys really put everything they had into this game and, and uh, it showed and they played really well. And, and I thought that Garrett really closed the show. I thought the second half, you started to see his strength pop up and he drew a lot of fouls too. That was another thing and, and, and helped get some of the front court players for UNLV into foul trouble. Garrett's really been a revelation this year. I mean, you know, there's been a lot of talk about the Juco players for IU and, and what they bring to the table. And I mean, I don't, I mean, IU didn't have a center to speak of last year. Daryl Thomas was playing center. Their previous center was Uwe Blop, who was many things, but athletic was not really one of them. I mean, he was relatively effective on the basket because he was seven feet, two inches tall. But it's really been since Landon Turner that IU had a center like Dean Garrett, like an athletic player who was just devastating 
on the board rugged and and rugged and and you know able to jump and then you know not a not the primary offensive option i mean he was 11.4 points per game this year the fourth leading scorer on the team but what he was able to do was you know be there to grab offensive rebounds and put it back in be there when the defense collapses on ricky calloway or on daryl thomas or on steve alford and I mean, he's just such a big difference in games like this. I mean, sure, there have been some games throughout the course of this year where you know he hasn't been as important as some of the other players. But in games like this, this is the ingredient that IU's been missing for several years uh, in, in terms of having a post presence that also was an athlete. And, it, and it, at a time when IU sometimes feels like they haven't gotten those types of players, and we read about that in Season on the Brink when it came out earlier this year about you know Knight's concerns with – the athleticism of his team. This is the kind of guy that IU's been needing to get for a long time. Yeah, I thought a couple other things with Garrett. One, he had a block uh, at one point, and one of those uh, his, his typical fist pumps nearly knocked out Armand Gilliam had he been in a slightly, uh, slightly different position. Um, but but they did mention, yeah, the, the JUCO thing, I think, at, at this point is maybe a bit overblown. They brought that up on the broadcast, how there were six JUCO guys in the game, which was – you know, somewhat typical for for UNLV, and, uh, and and less so for IU. But yeah, I, I just just can't say enough about what his performance was, particularly once Daryl Thomas got into foul trouble, uh, and how big uh, his performance was. So I'm sure we'll touch on him more as we go through the show tonight. Uh, but a big hat tip to Dean Garrett for uh, 18 points, 11 rebounds. As Ryan said, box where I have shows he plays 40 minutes. I do think they took him out briefly toward the end of the game to get yeah. Steve Isle in. Um, they were doing but, some offense defense stuff there. But yeah, he uh, he definitely earned every uh, every bit of the accolades that he got uh, for tonight's game. So we will, uh, like I said, we'll touch more on him as we go through the show. Uh, but for now, we're going to take a quick break. And uh, when we come back, we're going to point out some meaningful moments that you might have missed from the game. And then we'll uh, go inside the numbers to highlight some of the most important statistical notes as well. You're listening to the Assembly Call. Stick with us. This is Jordan Halls, and I never miss a shot, or an episode of The Assembly Call. You're listening to The Assembly Call IU Postgame Show. I'm Andy Bottoms here with Ryan Phillips and Galen Clavio, and tonight we are breaking down Indiana's 97-93 to victory over UNLV to advance to the NCAA championship game on Monday night. And it's time for tonight's meaningful moment that you might have missed, and I jotted down uh, quite a few of these as we as we go but I think there'll be uh, some good ways to to point out some of the players who uh, who really had a key impact on the game so I'm going to go back uh, a little bit to Steve Isle uh, as one of these uh, actually let's talk Joe Hillman first uh, there was a play in the uh, in the second half they got the ball to Hillman in the middle uh, looking to break the press he passes up to Dean Garrett, who misses, but Hillman outworked a, a much larger player to get an offensive rebound and then kicked it back out to Steve Alford for a, a jumper. Uh, that ended up being a two, nearly a three. Alford's toe was on the line. Uh, but Hillman, in a number of, of cases, in the second half in particular, really played well, uh, took advantage of UNLV's pressure by with some backdoor cuts, had a big layup uh, on a backdoor toward the end of the game, and just generally made smart decisions uh, with the basketball. And, and that was... His playing time was largely because Isle had gotten in foul trouble. Smart was in a little bit of foul trouble, but not really playing uh, all that well. So, you know, we I touched on Isle at the beginning, and we'll we'll get back to him on a couple of these meaningful moments. But, but Galen, uh, overall impressions of of Hillman's play uh, for a guy who didn't even come into the game until I want to say fourteen to sixteen minutes into the first half. Didn't play a ton in the first half, but uh, really stuck with it and played a key role in the second half. Yeah, he did. And, you know, I, I think that the thing to remember about Hillman is that he has been really the only backup at guard all year for this IU team. I mean, you know, the, the amount of minutes that Alford and Keith Smart have played throughout the course of the year have been pretty sizable. And I mean, you know, Joe started a couple of games, uh, I think four or five overall on the season, but, you know, he's just in there to kind of steady the ship to a large degree. And I think you saw a similar performance by him in the LSU game 
last weekend when they needed uh, a steadying hand. In that case, it was more, you know, due to Rick Calloway going out with a knee injury and, and being out for, for four or five minutes in that contest. This is what Joe Hillman does. And Joe Hillman is, is, is a, he's kind of an interesting player because if you look at Hillman, he doesn't really shoot that often and he's not that great of a shooter um you know but but he's he always makes smart plays he's he's a really good passer he's a really good utility player because he can play he's the steady point. yeah he's steady he's not gonna wow you but he's one of those guys where you if you need someone to come off the bench and not surrender a lot in terms of you know not throwing away a lot of turnovers and things like that he's the guy that you want and and so you know i think it's it's exciting because when you look at hillman his, uh, you know, he was he was out all last year uh, as a, I think he was redshirting last year, and he's made solid contributions. And this is a relatively thin IU team. This is one of the thinnest IU teams, particularly in the backcourt, that we've seen in a while. Uh, and every minute he plays is a crucial minute, and tonight was no exception. Ryan, any uh, any overarching thoughts on Hillman from you? I, I thought that he was just very steady as, as I, I interjected there. Apologies on interrupting Galen. Uh, but no, I just, I think that's, that's the word that came to me watching him play was just defensively. He was in the right position. I mean, he might've gotten beat a few times, but he was, he was where he was supposed to be. And uh, I thought that also it helped as, as Steve Alford sort of broke out in that second half. You noticed that a lot of the time that Alford was able to break out was when Hillman was bringing the ball up and Hillman was defending the top, you know, the top perimeter guy for, uh, for UNLV. And it allowed Alford to sort of be the floating guy uh, uh, guarding Mark Wade. And, and so that just took so much pressure off of Alford and allowed him to conserve some energy while, you know, Hillman's running around chasing guys down. And, and I thought that the 17 minutes he played as, as Galen said, were huge for the team. And, and any time you get out of him and any production you get out of him is a huge deal and, and is a huge benefit to this roster. Yeah, so the other the other guy I wanted to touch on uh, was was Steve Isle. Uh, you know, he came in much earlier in the game than you would have anticipated, but with Thomas uh, being left in with the two fouls and creating, and then getting called for a third foul uh, on a charge, uh, Isle immediately came in and paid dividends. Uh, got a tip in uh, on one of his first offensive possessions. Picked up a big defensive rebound in the next possession after. Uh, There was another play later in the half where he had good help defense. It led to a Dean Garrett block. He makes a save uh, falling out of bounds after a missed free throw. Um, And and I thought he really provided the same kind of spark in the first half that Hillman uh, provided in the second. And again, it was another guy that if you, you know, you look at at what he had done statistically there, you know, this was an unexpected performance, but he was another guy to, to use Ryan's word, uh, was really steady uh, for a guy who you know averages three points on the season, but it was just steady. Was a guy that they trusted to handle the ball. And if you look at the seven guys who played the bulk of the minutes for IU tonight, there were times that five of them were bringing the ball up the court. The only two who really didn't were Daryl Thomas and Dean Garrett. And uh, I think that speaks to Knight's confidence in those guys. But uh, Isles' performance to me was definitely a surprising one, and and really came through immediately. Uh, Galen, did you see anything leading up to this that would made you think this was possible for Isle, or uh, was it kind of an out of left field performance as it felt like to me? Isle's been a really strange player to watch over the course of his his two almost three years now in Bloomington. I mean, people forget this is a guy that started 14 games his freshman year. He started more games as a freshman than Dan Dockage started as a senior co-captain in 1985 and you know like you'd look at that and you say to yourself oh this is a guy we expect big things from and then last year he started one game didn't play very much this year he's played more certainly uh you know he's he's uh he certainly played more minutes than he played uh in 85 86 but uh he i mean he didn't really do a whole lot in those minutes he he doesn't shoot that often And he doesn't score that often. And I think you saw a lot of that tonight where he just, that wasn't what he was in there for. He was in there to essentially soak up minutes and make little plays and try to facilitate for everybody else. And I think that's, when you look at a guy like Steve Isle, I think you see the DNA of a lot of Bob Knight teams from, you know, the course of his 16 years at IU, where the whole idea is, look, you know, when we're fully functional, if we've got five guys that can all contribute at once, and I think you could, you know, go back to the 76 team, you know, probably the 81 team, then great. But most of these teams aren't built like that. They're built on 
a couple of guys who are top level and then a bunch of you know guys that fill roles and try to figure out how they can be effective players without overdoing it in the course of a game and I think for Isle you know he came in he didn't turn the ball over he made some good passes he had made some shots which which is relatively unusual for him and he just didn't take anything off the table and that's what you needed in that situation if you were going to be IU and you were going to survive Daryl Thomas going out with fouls like that and you got essentially almost a perfect game out of Steve Isle three for three from the field and five rebounds in 20 minutes of play that's more than you're expecting to get all across the board from Steve Isle. Yeah, so one of the other meaningful moments, this goes back to the first half, um, but there was an inbounds play. They basically threw it over the top to Keith Smart, ended up getting a layup there. And I think it was early enough in the game where you put the fear of that uh, into UNLV. Smart, as Ryan had mentioned earlier, played a lot better early in the game, did have uh, a turnover early, but but scored a decent number of points, uh, most of his points in the in the first half. I believe his only second half bucket was the one at the end, which was a an important one where he got a nice pass from Hillman and scored, uh, which hopefully gives him a little bit of confidence going into the the championship game. I, and I don't know how much of his performance was uh, nerves with being back home in Louisiana uh, or, or things like that. So I thought he played solid in the first half picked up a couple fouls late in the first half that really positioned him. Then when he came out in the second half, got another foul early there and eventually fouled out on kind of a silly play uh, at the end. You, you know, Ryan, what what kind of happened between his fast start and then, you know, kind of highlighted by that that long pass for a layup to, you know, really not contributing very much in the, and not even playing very much in the second half? I'm not sure what happened there. I, I think that Knight, was just more comfortable with what Hillman's with Hillman's steadying hand. And I think that, that it also, again, while Keith smart was bringing the ball up in the first half, for some reason, Steve Alford wasn't getting loose in the first half very much. I mean, he, he, he wound up going to the line. Some, he hit a couple shots, but he wasn't, he didn't, he didn't, he didn't feel like he was running the game. And it felt like in the second half, he was the threat from Indiana. And it felt like there was multiple angles. I, you could attack in the first half or the second half, Really, it was all based all around Alford. And I think that maybe the pairing between Alford and Hillman just worked better tonight as opposed to with Smart. Uh, Smart, I don't know. I thought he played well in the first half for the most part. I, I you know, he did have he did he wind up with two turnovers tonight, but I didn't feel like he was playing poorly. He was finishing at the rim well. Uh, it might be that that he just wasn't doing what he needed to do to get others involved in the offense. I'm not sure, but it clearly felt like. Bob Knight felt like he had more from Hillman in the second half than he was getting from, from Key Smart. And that was surprising initially, but then Hillman played well. And Hillman going in the game opened up the offense for Alford. So it might have been just something about that pairing, or, or maybe he did want to start slowing it down in the second half a little bit offensively, whereas Smart is a guy who wants to get out and go and wants to attack the rim. And maybe they wanted to run some more offense. And he would, and, and, as Knight mentioned in the post game, you know, he was worried about his guys getting tired. Maybe he wanted to pull back on the reins a little bit offensively just to sort of let them settle down. But um, yeah, smart only played 23 minutes after playing a lot in that first half. He only totaled 23 minutes for the game, but I thought he came out, as I mentioned in my opening, I thought he came out off the bat and he and Garrett really got IU going against a team that can blitz teams from the tip. And, and Indiana really was able to counter punch because of those two guys until Steve Alford started feeling, you know, sort of comfortable in the game. Keith Smart's had a weird tournament so far. He he set a record for assists in the Auburn game in the second round, 15 assists in that game. And then he had three against Duke in the Sweet 16. He had one against LSU and only had one in this game tonight. And, it, it, you know, it's interesting because he played fewer minutes. He only played 23 minutes, like Ryan said, in this game. But he had more points than he had in the LSU game where he played 39. He shot better. Uh, but I think Ryan really kind of hit the nail on the head. I, I think he he seems to be looking for his offensive game more than trying to be a facilitator. And I don't think that's entirely his fault. I think to some degree, that's the way that teams have been playing Alford. They've really, as you would expect, been just blanketing Alford. And a lot of the passes that Keith Smart has been making, uh, you know, if there, if there are passes that are trying to get the offense initiated, they're going to a secondary target in the post who's then having to turn around and try to get the offense going there. And so I think 
when you have Joe Hillman out there, it's a different sort of conceptualization that the offense is, is, is utilizing. Hillman knows he can't drive, whereas Smart knows that he can. And so I think Smart, to some degree, when he's in that position, he's like, I need to create something. Whereas Joe Hillman's like, I can't create something. I'm going to need to find a way to do it through my passing. And so that's when I look at Smart, I mean, he's obviously tremendously athletic, far more so than, you know, Stu Robinson or, or any of the point guards that I use had, I think, over the course of the past several years. But, um, you know, he had an effective game, just not an, as, a, as effective of a game as you need as a point guard in this particular contest. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see, you know, kind of where his head's at after sitting out so much of the second half, playing in front of a lot of family uh, and friends in Louisiana. So it'll be uh, curious to see what he comes out and does. But he he's definitely a guy that I he's going to need from an athleticism standpoint against the Syracuse team that looked really strong defensively today. Uh, so with that, let's uh, transition into stats. And I guess we'll use this to talk about Steve Alford. And it's odd to, to think that we've been sitting on here for 40 minutes and, and have – referenced him but not really talked in too much depth about his performance uh he ends up with 33 points 20 of those coming in the second half uh as i think ryan mentioned earlier was the only guy on iu to take a three-pointer hit two of those including one uh as part of a four-point play was eight of 15 from two-point range and 11 out of 13 from the line Uh, surprisingly missed uh two free throws in a row i know (laughs) it was uh that was that was stunning but uh but still ends up with 33 points. And, and yeah, I mentioned both he and Garrett uh, at parts of the second half really carrying the load. He made a number of, of nice baseline jumpers, a, a leaner that went in. Uh, and, and he's a guy that is easy to, I guess, in some ways take for granted at this point in his career that you know what you're going to you're gonna get from him. He's the focal point uh, of, of IU's offense and also um, the focal point of opposing defenses. But I thought um, he, he struggled early in the game, but then he scored seven quick points, ended up getting a second foul and got taken out. But um, I, I thought that stretch really got him going. And then in the beginning of the second half when IU wasn't um, doing a whole lot well, uh, you know, he scored the first four points for IU. Uh, then it was, uh, you know, uh, Daryl Thomas got a dunk. Uh, but then Alford went on another little run by himself where he scored uh, a number of points in, in a row and, and just thought he was um, the steadying influence in the second half, was able to use his shot fake to create space and get UNLV defenders going by. And I think, you know, with getting so many guys in foul trouble, as it, pretty much everybody in this game was in foul trouble, that, that played to his benefit, got, got himself to the line a lot and really – uh, excelled from there. So again, kind of odd that we haven't talked a whole lot about a guy that scored 33 points. But you know, Ryan, I'll kick it to you just to to talk about your overall impressions of Alford in, in a in a game that um, he didn't have a quiet 33 points by any means. But uh, some of the contributions of other guys uh, didn't overshadow what he did, um, but but gave us more to talk about than him as a guy that we've been talking about so much during the course of the season. Yeah, I mean, Steve Alford getting thirty is in a or thirty three in a big game is not is not earth shattering news. But I, I thought that he was really good, especially in the second half at attacking. And you saw him doing a lot. Of, you know, his work off screens and his work, you know, with ball fakes and just creating uh, angles for himself was phenomenal. Um, he really ran that defense ragged by running off of those screens and 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 you know the fact that he was able to relax a little bit on defense. And, and just sort of play center field some uh, probably s- helped him in the second half, just sort of settle into the game. Uh, I thought in the first half he was, he was maybe forcing or rushing a few things, but I thought in the second half he really settled into his game and uh, was really stepping into his shots and, and, you know, working really hard to get open and find ways to get open. Cause you know, the defense and it's going to happen again in the championship game, the defense is going to angle itself to stop him. And, and to fact that, teams do that and he still gets 33 points and still can score the way he does is incredibly impressive. It's a guy who just is built to score a basketball and, and, um, and shoot a basketball. And he's done a a phenomenal job all season and to put in 37 minutes uh, with the way he was being defended and come out on top is, is impressive. And also, yeah, to hit 11 to 13 free throws and have it be a disappointment just tells you what kind of player uh, Alford is and, and what Indiana relies on him. But I look, Indiana in the end needed all 33 of those points. Uh, They got, you're right. They got contributions from other guys that, that sort of overshadowed what he did, but 
uh, anytime you do that uh, in a final four game, you're going to get the respect you deserve. And, and a guy who, you know, scored 33 and, and shot 52% from the field as well. So he wasn't just gunning for shots. He was finding the right ones and he moved the ball when he didn't have angles and didn't have shots and found other guys too. He had a couple of great passes in the game. Uh, one, he whipped a no look pass to Keith smart under the hoop and smart almost was shocked by it, caught it and missed the layup. But uh, you know, he really had his eyes up and, and was moving the basketball really well too. Yeah. It's, it's still amazing to me that a relatively unathletic six, two kid cannot be defended by what is supposedly the best defensive team in college basketball. And we've seen this over and over and over again for four years now, very few, unless you're Purdue and you just, you know, decide to play, uh, you know, football on a basketball court with Alford and the refs let you do it. There's, there's essentially no way to stop this guy. And it's games like this where you really just tip your cap and you're like, wow, this is, uh, this is a really special player. It's, it's, you know, and, and it's a, a different kind of player from what IU has seen, I think as their best player, you know, you go back through the years. I mean, Isaiah Thomas was, was, you know, a, a miracle athletically and from a court vision perspective. And, uh, you know, you go back to the 76 teams and, you know, you got, you know, Bobby Wilkerson's like six, eight or six, nine or whatever. And you've got all these guys that are just tremendous physical specimens and Alford's not like that, but, but what Alford is, is just a tremendously smart on the court player. He's a guy who just so quickly sights the rim and gets the ball off and, and has it with just the right amount of touch that, you know, it's going to go in and just such tremendous discipline to work off the ball as often as he does and trust his teammates to get him the ball when he needs it. And in this kind of a game where UNLV is flying all over the place and, you know, they, they're outsizing certainly Alford with almost whoever they've got on him. And he's still able to fight his way through screens and around screens and slip out when he is the focal point of the defense. Uh, you know, he did it last week against UNLV or excuse me, against LSU. Uh, you know, he's done it over and over again throughout the course of his career. And on this big of a stage, a stage he's never been to before, he has maybe one of his two or three biggest games as a college player. I mean, I think it's a, a really amazing uh, and, and laudatory performance by him. Yeah, he he really, you know, a, a stretch that stood out for me toward the end of the game. IU had struggled at the free throw line. You had uh, you had Hillman, I think, missed the front end of a one and one. You had Isle miss the front end of a one and one, and then you had Garrett miss the the front end. And it kind of at that point, Alford was give me the ball. I'm going to be the one to get fouled and, and knock down two toward the end of the game to kind of push the game out of reach. The the Isle play that I referenced earlier definitely sealed it but you know he just he really had a lot of success working on the baseline um shot fakes really took advantage of some of UNLV's aggressiveness and being able to uh get where he wanted to go and got to the line a lot in the second half so a really good performance from him the other guy I wanted to, to use the stats to talk about was uh was Rick Calloway he he ended up with uh 12 points uh, as Ryan mentioned had a few few really big buckets uh in the second half uh, that were there 12 points led the team with six assists we talked about smart not having a ton uh, facilitating it was it was Callaway who had six assists on the game and also second on the team in rebounds with with six rebounds as well so for a sophomore playing in that kind of game uh, playing 40 minutes and I think he truly did not go out, out one second of the game um, I thought it was a, a poised performance from him uh, hopefully a sign of what he can grow into as a player, but, you know, a little bit understated maybe compared to, to some of the other guys, but I, I really thought a couple of, of big plays uh, fr from Callaway. Galen, any other, other thoughts on, uh, on him? Well, and I mean, with the injury he suffers last week in the LSU game where he's down on the floor and, you know, can't get up again and they have to take yeah, him then out he and goes down again in this game and everybody yeah. luckily he's you know mouthing it's a cramp but everybody's hearts in their throat again with that guy you know i mean and he's playing with a knee brace that I mean, if you took it off and hit someone with it they might get knocked unconscious I mean, it's, it's enormous just, it's crazy and and yet he's able to maintain that level of athleticism and that level of lateral movement uh you know it's funny because we we talked about keith smart not having that many assists in this game we talked about joe hillman stepping in for a little bit Rick Calloway had six assists in this game. You know, he was the secondary distributor. He was the guy that was getting the ball and then figuring out where it needed to go in the high post. And, and I think that that, A, is, is certainly a testament to, to Calloway's vision 
and his understanding of where the ball is supposed to go and, and where the defense isn't. It's also a testament tonight, knowing that, you know, if, if you're not able to penetrate from the guard position, he's got a guy that he can utilize in that role. And you know, look, I think Callaway has been, and you, you heard, you know, Bill, Billy Packer and Brent Musburger slobbering all over him during the broadcast. And for good reason, because this is a guy who really looks like someone who could be special down the line. I mean, he is, he's, he's rail thin. I mean, I, I, he needs to stop skipping meals, uh, you know, but, but his, his contribution so far throughout the course of his career, you're just like, wow, the sky's the limit for this guy. I mean, he averaged almost 14 points a game and almost five rebounds a game last year. Those numbers have dropped off slightly, but that's because you've introduced Dean Garrett to the roster. You've introduced Keith Smart to the roster, and he's still averaging 12 and a half points and four rebounds a game. And he is such a key part of this team's offense. And you saw that in the, uh, in the LSU game, like how important he was throughout that game and certainly down the stretch when he's on and when defense is back off him a little bit, he presents such a, a frustrating dynamic for the opposition because the way that you set up to stop Steve Alford leaves Ricky Callaway open. And, and that has been, I think the big difference between last year's team where he was still kind of growing into that role in this year's team. And it's why this year's team has won 29 games so far. So let's, uh, so other, a couple other team stats. I think we've touched on a couple of the ones that stand out the most to me. Um, one was the three point shooting. I mean, we, we touched on this earlier. UNLV takes 35 three pointers in the game, makes 13 of them for 37%. IU takes four. Uh, and, and I think some of that is goes back to, in, in some of the cases, the threes that UNLV took were shots that IU wanted them to take. Uh, and, and there for were times sure. when I, yeah, and, and there were times when IU, I think, had, had threes, but felt confident that if they worked a, a little bit, they could get a better shot uh, for them. And so I think that was um, that was important. Overall, the shooting percentage for IU was 61.7%. They made 62.5% on twos. Unbelievable. Uh, versus UNLV shoots 42.7%. Now, the offensive rebound numbers that Ryan talked about play into that as well. Uh, IU, again, makes more opponents or makes more free throws than its opponent shoots. They were 21 of 28 versus 10 and 19 uh, for UNLV. So those are a couple of the team numbers that stand out. Uh, Ryan, did I, did I steal one of the ones that you had or did you have something else? Well, the team shooting percentage was, was great. I figured you'd get that. But the fact that four of the five starters shot over 60%. And the other one was Alford, who shot 52.6%, but also got to the line 13 times to sort of make up for the missed shots. Um, and then off the bench, Isle went three of three, Hillman three of four. So you had seven guys who shot the most, you know, over 60% uh, other than Alford. And, and again, Alford was at 52.6 and and 53% on, on twos. So and he just shot the ball ridiculously well. And part of that, you know, it's not just they were out of their mind shooting. They weren't making crazy shots that just happened to be falling. They were taking good shots, and a lot of them within 15 feet, uh, most of them within 15 feet, and even more than that within 10. So I think that really is the the takeaway from this game offensively is that was just taking great shots and, and not forcing shots. And – you know, you'd see a guy run in for a layup, maybe throw it up a little crazily, but he didn't do that again. You know, he, you didn't see Indiana fall into a pattern of forcing anything. They found good shots. And you mentioned the offensive rebounds. I mean, 21 for UNLV, 10 for Indiana. Indiana has to clean that up. I know we mentioned that earlier. They have to clean that up if, you know, going against Syracuse. That, ha that cannot happen in that championship game. Galen, any uh, numbers stand out to you? Man, I mean, just looking across the board, I think the two numbers that stand out, I've, I've mentioned one of them already, but it's that UNLV shot 42.7% from the field. Uh, you know, I really think that even with all those offensive rebounds, that, yeah, that 82 that, field goal attempts for UNLV in yeah, the game. Um, and they only made 35. They had more offensive rebounds than defensive rebounds in this game. 21 uh, offensive. That's and, staggering. And that is a staggering fact. Which, I, you know, to some degree, I mean, it, it highlights – how much you know IU was was hitting shots well you know I think that that's that's a big part of it but uh, I think the other number that stands out to me is um, you know when you look at, at IU everybody except for Cree Smith who shot the ball shot over 50 percent you know Alford was actually the worst percentage on that he shot 53 percent for the game but 
Daryl Thomas shot 60%. Joe Hillman shot 75%. Keith Smart did Galen not listen to what I just said? Oh, did, did you say that too? <laughs> I well, just well, did that. I just, okay, I'll reiterate you're pulling, a, you're pulling a Ryan. Mm-hmm. Well, right <laughs> I, I, will, I will take... I will take that. I was. Well, so, you guys uh, are very young at this point. It's easy to get <laughs> distracted. I'm, I'm up I mean, way past my bedtime here. <laughs> I get know? it. But, happens to me all the time. But I, I get but it. I will, it's just funny. I will throw in in addition to that. I think if you look at the way that UNLV, they had guys that you know, I have a couple of guys shot very well. I mean, Armin Gilliam, fifty three percent, but they had three guys who didn't make a shot that they shot. And it's just like yeah. when you look at the the dichotomy between how IU was able to capitalize almost every time they did something offensively, whereas UNLV had to work on every single possession. I mean, it's just, it really drove home how much at the end of the game, it wasn't IU that was struggling to to keep their legs. It was really UNLV. And I don't think anybody would have expected that. Yeah. A couple other quick individual things for UNLV, just oddities. Uh, So we talked about Mark Wade, 18 assists, nobody else on UNLV. He actually had more assists than the entire IU team and nobody else on UNLV had more than one. Uh, the other was Gerald Patio, two still, of thirteen. Way, from I still the, maintain assists are like the most overrated stat in basketball. But anyway, let's continue. Yeah, yeah. I agree with you. And uh, Gerald Gerald Patio, two of thirteen from the floor. Uh, there are times that you'll see guys who are look really confident and think the ball's going in every time that they shoot it. Gerald Patio is the exact opposite of that. He would get into basically a dead sprint at the basket as soon as he shot, anticipating a miss, which more often than not, for a guy that was 2 of 13, was the correct move. So uh, it was uh, it was a little jarring to see the way that, uh, that he kind of went about Playing about in that. a dome can be rough on sh- jump shooters if you're not used to it. So I that that's what I think was going on with him. He just did not look comfortable at all. And they talked him up as a big shooter before the game. And was he he was the one that that Tarkanian said he can't do anything but shoot. And and <laughs> I mean he he didn't live up to it live up to that billing during the game. Yeah, exactly. All right. Well, coming up on the assembly call, we're going to hand out our game balls and we'll talk about what aged the best and the worst from this game and then try to put it all into the proper historical context. That's all next here on the assembly call. Stick with us. Sizeloft, I never miss an open three, and I never miss an episode of The Assembly Call. You are listening to The Assembly Call IU Post Game Show. Catch us live immediately following every IU basketball game, plus every Thursday night at our website, assemblycall.com. And while you're there, make sure you sign up for our free IU Hoops email newsletter. Over 7,000 of your fellow IU fans have already subscribed. You can also text IU to 66866 to subscribe to the newsletter. That's IU to 66866. I'm Andy Bottoms here with Ryan Phillips and Galen Clavio from Crimson Cast. And now it's time for our game balls. A uh, couple decent options for this one. Uh, Galen, I'll throw it to you first. Who gets your game ball from this performance? Well, I mean... I'll just I'll jump on the Steve Alford train here uh, because I'm going first, but I, I don't know how you give it to anybody else. I mean, 33 points and, you know, just, just rock solid for 37 minutes in this contest. And this is senior leadership personified. It's what you need if you're IU and you know, look, I mean, could other people have scored if Alford hadn't sure, but they didn't have to. And that was the important point. And Alford, despite being the number one target of the defense throughout the night, was just unflappable, as he always is. So uh, easy game ball, really a a no-brainer as far as I'm concerned. Ryan, you've always been a big Alford fan. Uh, Should we assume that he gets your game (laughs) ball here as well? Yeah, I look, I, I think you could you could give some love to Dean Garrett for playing 40 minutes and really being solid in the post uh, 18 and 11. I think you could even give it to Steve Isle for for the uplift. He gave the team off an unexpected, you know, uplifting performance off the bench uh, just for, you know, the contribution to the team because the team could have gone in the tank with with Daryl Thomas out early. Uh, instead, no, I'm giving it to Steve Alford. I thought this was a vintage Alford performance and and just uh, you know, your best player stepping up when you need him the most. And you look at the final score and it felt like Indiana was doing this pretty comfortably late, about five to seven minutes left. You felt real comfortable about the result of this game turned, you know, and maybe a little relaxed because you liked the way it was going, but 
they needed all 33 of his points in this game. And, and I think that was huge. And, and, and for him to step up the way he did, uh, that he gets, he gets the game ball for sure. Yeah. It did feel like IU was, you know, working after falling behind in the beginning of the second half, kind of worked to like an eight to 10 point margin for a good chunk of it. But UNLV did get, it. I think they got it within five at one point. Gilliam could have made it four if he'd made the a free throw after getting fouled by apparently elbowing Daryl Thomas was a foul, but, um, on Daryl Thomas, but, uh, yeah, I, I'll, I'll give mine to Alford as well. I think the gap is is a little maybe closer than you might suspect when you look at the box score with with how Garrett played and just the importance uh, of what he of what he was able to do by playing that many minutes. But yeah, I think Alford really in the second half when they needed somebody to make baskets when they didn't get off to a good start, he made a couple jumpers early um, and and kind of settled everybody down, uh, showed the leadership at the end of the game there. So uh, we'll make it a clean sweep with Alford. I, I thought it was close with uh, with Garrett, but uh, but we'll go uh, we'll go Alford for this one. So, all right, so what we've been trying to do with these was look at what age is the best and what age is the worst. I mean, what age is the worst, uh, we'll, we'll maybe do that first, was Billy Packer's uh, pregame opinion of how you should play the game. Uh, but but maybe beyond that, uh, Galen, what what stood out to you that did not age well? We we don't get to talk about the CBS line of programming like the, we did the last time that you and I were on one of these. Yeah. Uh, since you had uh, you you did such a good job of editing out the commercials, was, uh, which I know you've said before was like your dad was I think militant I believe is the word that you described about uh, about not getting those in. So we won't know for sure what uh, was due up in CBS's programming. But anything uh, uh, aged particularly poorly for you? I, I've I hope to never hate anything quite as much as my dad hated commercials uh because that was a pretty pretty deep reservoir of hate there but uh, uh i will i will give uh, matt zimmerman some credit because he actually took the time to look up what china rose was yeah that sounded it, familiar to me for yeah, some reason it's like george c scott and ali mcgraw and it, i mean like do like go find matt it, matt's uh, twitter account and that sounds like a really dire show. Like it got aggressively panned in that Washington Post review that he posted. Uh, so that didn't age well. Um, you know, I think from a the outside of that, the um, the whoever was in charge of UNLV's uh, like call back to the floor, crazy the right halftime period. Like, how the hell does that happen? Like, as a former I, player. Like that, there's one guy whose job it is literally to stand there and wait until the clock goes to a certain level and run back and tell the team. Now, some uh, gyms now will have a clock in the locker room. Yeah. Um, and I'm sure every college has that now. But like when this I was, was playing, I don't know yeah, if they just I, underestimated how far they had to get from the locker room to the court. I mean, it's a combination of that, too. But I'm you'd sure also already done it dome. before. So it seemed yeah. like you'd have been able to figure out how long oh it would take my, you having already was, made that walk before. That was mind blowing to me that like you don't have a manager standing there watching the clock and like relaying to somebody else who then relays to the team. Hey, we got to get out and warm up. I mean, that was yeah. wow. Like, I couldn't believe that. Yeah. And so um, that I, that's still every time I, I forget about it sometimes. And then I go back and I watch this game. And I was like, oh, yeah, that's right. Like the team almost didn't come out for the second half. <laughs> and that that really has aged incredibly poorly. Um, so. Yeah, that, those what, are my main things. By the way, was Jim Nance a teenager in this? It's crazy. Well, it's that's insane. the thing. I, I, I mean, it, it, this didn't so much age badly, but like you had young and slim Jim Nance. You have young and slim James Brown. James and Brown. Had, and you had young and and still kind of not attractive Jim Bayheim. Like <laughs> Don't all that, that, the Bayheim interview was incredible. He's talking about how he's talking about how much he loves their man to man defense. And I almost threw something at the screen the TV screen. Yeah, he he actually seemed remotely likable in that scenario, which <laughs> would 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 come to not be the case at all. Yeah. How about Mike Shashevsky like, looking about, like? How about catching Mike Shashevsky like blowing a bubble? Blowing a bubble. Like, <laughs> of all the things. Come on, let's let's help our guy out here a little bit. Oh, yeah, those, man. those that, are good. Like, yeah, the, 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 time, he's still just time. a he's still just a former Bob Knight assistant at this point. That's what I, I think is the most hilarious. Like yeah. this is this is pre blossoming Mike. Well, Krzyzewski. he had taken hadn't he taken Duke to a Final Four at that point? The previous year, that was previous the year, yeah. Phyllis, Mark Allery, Johnny right. Dawkins team, and then yeah. they they obviously lost this year. But then this was a this would have been. The start of that, you know, is Duke actually going to win a title or are they going to be like the, you know, the the Marquette under Al McGuire yeah. for many years thing where they just keep knocking on the door and never make it? Because they wouldn't win their first title for another, what, four years after this. They won their mm -hmm. first one in 91. 
Yeah. Um, was that Providence team that made the final? Was that a Rick Pitino team? That was Rick Pitino. It was. Billy Donovan was Billy the Donovan, star player. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Delroy, that's what I thought. Delray Brooks, former IU player, was on that team. That's right. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. And then, yeah, he got the Knicks job like the next year, I think, right yeah. after that. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, there was just some stuff where I was, I mean, by the way, how hard is it to watch a game? It's amazing how we're conditioned now without the score and the time and the shot clock on the screen. I had no idea how much time was on the shot clock. I was because there were times where I'm like, that's this a shot. Game, it rarely got, got close, but yeah, you're I right. Know, but I was, I was thinking like, that's got to be a shot clock violation. You know, like there was one where a guy tipped a ball and he ran into the corner and they passed it around. And they got tipped again. I was like, this got to be a shot clock violation. And there's just I, I had no idea. Um, well, I, it was just I, I so weird. To, well, you know. I joke. I joked the one time in earlier in the show about like I was trying to see because I knew how many points Gilliam had for the game, and they're like, "He's already got twenty six. I was like, "Oh, what is this?" They wouldn't even put the clock up every time they showed the score. Sometimes no. it would be just the score, but no clock. Sometimes it would be both, but it was yeah. That that's God I mean, that's, bless graphics people who came up with that. Finally, like that person should be put in every sports hall of fame. Like I mean, yeah. because you look at what a every novel idea. Now. So people, so you think people would want to always know what the score and time is of the game well and every every game has that now every sport every game has a score and a clock in the corner whoever started that trend is a hero so i gotta say i i'm not as bothered by it as you guys are and i don't know why i i think it works really well in football because i like of knowing course time what's going on in football it doesn't bother me as much in this because it felt like when they needed us to know when there was time on the clock they would show it. And I think the reason they didn't show the shot clock in this game was, I don't know if the shot clock ever got under 20. Yeah, that's fair. Team. Like they were just, they were just fire. I'm just it used to it. Yeah. yeah. You know, there were a couple I, I things for it, IU that did, but yeah, I, I, it, I don't know that it ever would have gotten, I'm not sure it ever got under 30 for UNLV. Yeah. yeah no, I mean it, the thing with the time and score it's, I could deal with it not being on the screen constantly. If they were like, after, you know, a couple possessions, they put it up and like showed you. You know, just to update you what's going on. I mean, Galen, how many times have you watched this game? How, how You pretty much, you pro yeah, yeah, you probably 40. know what the score is at every point in that game. <laughs> oh, yeah, I, I use up seven right now. It's like, because yeah. you lose track, you know? And and uh, so it was just, I'm also, you know, I watch sports for my job all day, every day, and I'm just so used to having it there as like a reference point. It is kind of weird to get into the weeds. Like UNLV went on a 6-0 run at one point. I had no idea what, who was who well, was up by what. You know. I will say this, the, the lack of shot clock and the fact we didn't see it. And the fact that, I mean, there's a, there's a great quote. I forget which book it is. It might've been season on the brink that it's like the postscript that talks about this year. Cause this was the first year, the, or the second year, the 45 second shot clock and Ricky Calloway's in practice and, and he's worried about the shot clock. And, and uh, you know, Knight says something like, "Ricky, don't worry about the shot clock. The sob never goes off." <laughs> uh, and 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 it to some degree was true. Like there was not, I don't believe, a shot clock violation in this game. Uh, there were very no. few. And to me, if you want to talk about what's aged the worst, it it's actually in this game, the the offensive competency of the players it blows most of the players today out of the water. Like For their, sure. their, their knowledge of where they were and what they were supposed to be doing, the, the offensive systems, you know, it's one of the things that we debate a lot on Crimson cast is, you know, the idea that it's not the shot clock that's, that's needed as much as it is a change in refereeing and also a change in the way that players are taught the game because man, throughout the eighties and throughout the nineties, at least the first part of the nineties, um, the players just knew what they were supposed to do on offense by and large, at least among the top teams. And, and I feel like you, you just see that less and less. Now everything is so, uh, you know, minutely controlled. There's no plays being called, certainly not by IU in this game. It's just like, go do what you need to do. You know what you're supposed to do. And they're just running offense. And, yeah, they and they're all on the same. The, the big thing to me is they're all on the same page. Yeah. They all know what they're supposed to be doing and they all know what the other guys are supposed to be doing. Yeah. So they know where to look for each other. You know, I, I rewatched, we did the rewatch of the LSU uh, game from 92, I think mm -hmm. 91 or 92. I think it was 92 against Shaq. And they just all knew exactly where each other were going to be. They knew, okay, what they're giving us, we know how to diagnose this and we know we need to attack there. And there it was a short corner. They attacked a short corner for 25 minutes of that game. And it's just, they're all on the same page. 
And I think the things that stood out to me about this was a, the big men could all shoot. They could all shoot from 10 feet and in. You saw, I mean, Gilliam, that foul line jumper (laughs) twice in the first half was just like, so like without hesitation, just goes up and shot it. I mean, to be fair, that dude played in the NBA for for this is fair. This is fair. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah. No, but I mean, you know, and the big men could shoot the athletic guys weren't just athletic. They had skills as well. You know, they weren't just driving and, and dunk it or lay it in. Um, but I also thought that the the interesting part was no matter who it was, even if it was your athlete, even if it was your deep guy off the bench who has no athleticism, even if it was this guy, that guy, whatever, they all knew just how, like they were all versed in the offense and they were all versed in like, OK, we're attacking the free throw line now. Let's get it to Garrett there and let guys work off of him. OK, let's get it to Alford off these two screens when he's going to come around. We know to swing the ball to this perfect spot like. It, you're right. It's just there was a basketball, a level of basketball intelligence. And by the way, how many times did you guys see somebody pass up a semi open shot for a better shot for somebody else? Yeah. Nowadays, it feels like if a guy gets a semi open shot, he's taking it because, you know, you may never it, maybe you won't get it again. But it feels like they catch the ball. They might have a window to take that shot, but they realize the next guy down the line on the, you know, on the swing in the ball or whatever, will have more room and they passed it up. And I, that was the most impressive part to me is that guys were, you know, passing it along and, and keeping it going and keeping the chain going and not being selfish about getting their own shots up. Yeah. I, I thought that was true too. There were a number of times where I felt like even though IU was trying to play a little bit faster than they may normally have done, like they still weren't just taking the very first reasonably good shot that they, um, that they could. And just, I mean, we, this has been true of really any of the, the, certainly the 92, 93 teams we've talked about the shot faking and things like that. Alford got himself a number of good looks just by doing that. I think Callaway had a really good drive by just doing kind of fundamental things and, and even to your point of guys just knowing what to do, I, I still was struck by against a super high pressure defense. IU was willing to let basically anybody, but the two forwards, the two big men bring the ball up the court. I mean, even I think Cree Smith even did when he, he was in, of course, like, that was terrifying. I think Musburger, I think Musburger was even like, he, or Packer was like, he needs to get rid of the ball. But was it Steve? Um, I went behind the back at one point on a dribble across yeah, mid court. I was like, Whoa, Wait a yeah. second. Like, yeah. So it's good. Um, any, anything age particularly well in this one? I know we're uh, we're already over an hour, and I, I don't know that we need to spend a ton of time on historical context because we can probably do that after the, the 87 championship game. There was one point on that I wanted to bring up, but anything else age uh, particularly well as you uh, look through this one? Well, you, there might not have been a better – minute and a half summation of the Bob Knight philosophy on running a basketball program than that interview that they shot at halftime. That yeah. little montage. Like <laughs> oh you want to talk gosh. about, hey, let's take the Bob Knight encyclopedia and, and like condense it into a leaflet that we'll Just hand out at the corner down down and done in Like that was yeah. yeah, that was like so that was fun to watch. Um I you know I'll say this I and this is gonna sound weird and I might get some some pushback for this, but um it's it's pretty common to hate on billy packer and billy packer's got a really it's he's got a bad tone of voice he, he sounds smarmy but man that guy was a really good basketball analyst in the 80s like he yeah. was pointing things out that you were not noticing he was bringing interesting things to the forefront he was not afraid to to call coaches out uh and it it's it's jarring to, to hear i think in a good way because it's like wow that guy knew what he's talking about and was willing to say it and there wasn't a lot of kowtowing to coaches there wasn't a lot of that I mean it was that was really I I I didn't really notice it the last 828 or 29 times I've watched the game but I was like yeah you know I really am glad Billy Packer was calling this game Ryan anything else for you uh I mean I just thought it was it was in it was fun. I think, you know, it aged well, the three point line aged well, I would say <laughs> whether or not you like it uh, in, in the game or its influence on the game. Uh, this was the first full season with the three point line. wasn't, I always get 86 yep. and 87 well, views, but this, this is the first time. Kind of. It, this was the first year that the NCAA had a full year of the three point line. Right. The one of my favorite little mini trivia questions uh, is in 82, 83, the big 10 had the three point line for the whole year but it was just a conference rule and they were kind of oh, okay. like experimenting with it. And that was the year that I think Whitman and Kitchell both shot like 40% from three and the big 10 immediately pulled the rule for the next. Three yeah. Years. Cause it was unfair. So, yeah. right? but, but this what was Alford, the first... 
Alford shot like fifty two percent. Fifty two percent. Yeah, yeah. It was ridiculous. Uh, unbelievable. And and think about. And I know this is brought up all the time in Indiana circles, but think about if Alford's career, all four years, he'd had the three point shot. How many points he would have scored? It's insane to to consider that. But um, no, I thought I think that the three point shot change the game in some ways as it did take away that mid range jumper, because it's, if you're going to shoot from there, why not learn to shoot the three? And, and um, it took years for that to happen, but eventually it did. And and no one shoots mid range jumpers anymore. And I thought it was actually kind of beautiful basketball, seeing guys be able to shoot at 10, 15 feet tonight, um, you know, and big men and small guys kind of finding little areas and, and Alford shot a lot of mid range jumpers in this too. And, and his shot was, you know, as fantastic as we remember, but I thought that was, that was something that was interesting that the three point line existed, but Indiana didn't try and exploit it in this one. And I know they had at different times during the year, but with such a great shooter, you would think, you know, they would be hammering the three point line, but again, people weren't used to it. So uh, that was interesting. That was an interesting aspect of this is that the three point line existed, but it wasn't the focus that it is now. Yeah. So, you know, Galen, to go back to your Billy Packer point, I, it was kind of it. I, I think I noticed it as it was happening, but I didn't really like kind of pull it out when you said it. But yeah, he was pretty critical of some of the Tarkanian substitutions. Even when Knight was trying to get Alford back in was really like he needs to take a timeout. With, he's got this group out here. He's trying to get Alford back in. And, you know, Knight ends up end of the game. He's got four timeouts, which I used a couple uh, getting trapped on the on the sideline. Garrett ended up making a big shot. It didn't matter. But he yeah, definitely was not afraid to, to talk through some of that, which was, uh, which was good. Um, and you know, Musburger with yeah, like immediately said the point spread before anything had yeah. really started about who Notice was there. That, so. And he yeah. kept calling him Vegas instead so of that, UNLV or Las yeah. Vegas. So, you know, what Vegas you with a big play. Uh, yeah. So, so real quick on historical context and then we'll, we'll kind of wrap things up. I, I think, you know, we can kind of talk about what happened from, from this season going forward after we do the 87 championship game in a little bit. Yeah, I, I thought, I thought one of the things, though, this is always a game that's pointed to with Knight just in terms of his coaching acumen and being able to do something that was maybe unexpected um, and and just the right buttons to push. I feel like this is a game that is often cited um, with that. And, and Galen, you mentioned something about this earlier where, you know, you're a few years removed from the 81 championship and uh, that this was potentially the first group that would have gone through without winning a big 10 title. They had taken care of that, uh, at that point, but it was, uh, you know, obviously the, how the, the tournament would end up was a big feather in his cap as well. But I always feel like if, if there's a, a list of games that people point to, to really talk to about night, this is almost always one that comes up. Yeah. It's the short list is always this game, the 84 game versus North Carolina. And, you know, I mean, there's probably one. The UCLA game in 1992 is yep. probably one that makes the list as well. But this and this was really, you know, you know, it was interesting because it was 16 years into Knight's tenure at IU, and he was, I think, there was still this was still when IU was on top of the world from a college basketball perspective. Like this was the the this was the empire period for IU basketball under Bob Knight, and this was the kind of game that you just, you felt like going in, you had a better chance of winning because Bob Knight was coaching the game. And, and this is why, and, you know, I mean, look, this is, it's, it's ironic because, you know, as you guys mentioned the three point line that combined with the shot clock ended up being the agents of change that would eventually wear away at the edges of what Knight had done coaching wise, you know, you figure, you know, within 15, 16 years, under one set of rules and in a two year span, two major rules ended up changing. And so, um, you know, it didn't make him any, he was still a great coach afterwards, but the perfection he had maintained in terms of understanding how the game was coached started to have to change. And I think that other coaches kind of figured it out. Krzyzewski being a great example, uh, a little bit better moving forward, but this was, this is one of those apex games for night. And, and I think that, especially when you consider how talented 76 and 81 were, this was not as talented a team and, and yet they still pulled off a really impressive victory in this game. Yeah. And I think, I think you couple that a little bit with the, they made a lot. We talked about this earlier too, with bringing in Juco guys and it was kind of like a, well, maybe nights changing and trying to adapt to different things, which was really needed with this team to get more athleticism on it. But, uh, 
but still hadn't strayed so far from the, you know, just being a great X's and O's and strategy guy. And, and this game kind of pulled all that together uh, a bit in that way. So we'll touch more on the context of this particular team and kind of what would happen in, uh, in subsequent years. Cause it definitely, it was a, you know, kind of a, a little bit of an odd group because you, you knew you were losing Alford who had been the focal point, but you did have Garrett and, and smart. And so I think people were probably, a little bit unsure of what things would happen from there. You know, you're losing a, a transcendent player who had been uh, such a big, big member of IU. But I think with the way that it would play out, eventually you'd there was enough there to maybe give yourself a little bit of confidence um, between that. And then you, you obviously had Edwards and um, and Lyndon Jones coming in. So uh, we'll, we'll touch on some of that after the uh, after the 87 championship game for the for the sake of time on this one. Uh, so just a quick reminder, we are not quite at the end of our rewatch series. Uh, the next one will be on Monday night. We're going to do all three championship games, not all three on Monday. Um, but we'll be, uh, starting with the 76 championship game, IU Michigan on Monday. I believe, uh, that's coach Ryan and Chris, if uh, the schedule that I had is still accurate. So, uh, if anyone wants to join us for that details there at assemblycall.com slash rewatch. And then next weekend We'll do the 81 and 87 championship games to uh, to wrap that up. So you are listening to the Assembly Call IU Post Game Show. And remember that because you're an Assembly Call listener, you get 20% off of your entire order at homefieldapparel.com with the promo code ASSEMBLY20. So if you want a great deal on the most comfortable and unique IU apparel that you'll find anywhere, go to homefieldapparel.com and use the promo code ASSEMBLY20 for 20% off your entire order. All right, guys, it's time for last call. And Ryan, I will throw it to you first. Uh, final thoughts on IU's 97-93 win in 1987 over UNLV. That was fun. Uh, UNLV, basically number one all year. IU in the top five all year. Those are dream matchups you hope for in the final four is, is two top-level teams um, with top-level players facing each other. And uh, it was a classic Steve Alford game. I mean, you look back at, at some of his biggest performances and that's gotta be right at the top. Uh, a great coaching game from, from Bob Knight as, as Galen had pointed out, one of the apex games where you just take your reputation to another level. I mean, I know at that point he'd already won two national titles and, and was consistently considered one of the great coaches of all time. Uh, he's already at that level, but you know, that's, that's a game where you just put your stamp on it and say, nah, even better than you thought. And, and, uh, you know, guys like Dean Garrett, Key Smart, um, Steve Isle having a big game, Callaway playing 40 minutes. I mean, it was really a fun game to watch, and it was really fun to see those guys all kind of just, you know, playing at their peak and, and beating a team that a lot of people said they weren't going to beat. And and so uh, really an interesting game to watch from a, from a strategy perspective, and it was just a blast. And so thanks, everybody, for tuning in. And uh, it was – thanks, Galen, for – you know, helping facilitate with your uh, VHS skills and, uh, <laughs> but uh, appreciate everybody coming along for the ride on this. These have been really fun. And of course, for a guy like me who didn't get to IU until 2003, uh, going back through the archives and watching some of these games and, and watching the games and then uh, watching the post game shows and participating in them has, has been a blast. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks Ryan. And uh, Galen, final thoughts from you real quick. You know, this, the 87 tournament thing is like, uh, that that whole stretch frank it's like the if the if iu basketball is the beatles this is like the white album like it's great and it, they've just had so many different types of games throughout the course of the tournament and they won in so many different ways they got so many different contributions from so many different people uh it was just really really outstanding and i was i loved watching this whole stretch of games uh particularly these last you know the the like the, the, the duke game the lsu game the unlv game and then the syracuse game i grew up with essentially a tape that had all four of those games on it. And I watched them over and over again as a kid. And it still brings me a lot of joy. Um, it's a, it's a great book of basketball, essentially. Like it's a great, it's great to go back and watch how the games were played, not just IU, the way that the teams that they played, play, uh, play the game as well. Um, just brings me a nice, warm, fuzzy feeling inside. Andy, and I appreciate you guys having me along to be able to talk about it. No, it, it really has been great. And, and these were, uh, it, it's been fun to rewatch some of these games because of some of the interviews the Hoosier Hysterics guys have done because they've talked to Smart and Garrett uh, about some of these about some of these games and some of the things that happened and it was uh, it's been fun to kind of remember some of the things that they talked about. Uh, I think Joe Hillman was another guy that they uh, that they had talked to and so like putting some of their content comments 
into the context of the game and, and what had happened has added another layer of it to me. And and this is one that I always, if I, I one of the first things I did when Big Ten tournament got canceled, I had taken that Friday off and I was just like, well, I'm just going to watch some old games. And this was one of the first ones that I queued up uh, just because it was, uh, you know, I was eight at the time. We talked about this before uh, we, we went on. And so I you know, don't remember it super vividly, but I definitely remember watching the game. And I remember uh, I remember the excitement of, of that whole tournament run because there was, as you said, a lot of ups and downs where they would, you know, fell behind and, and really came back to, to beat Auburn. They had slow starts really throughout the tournament. Uh, the Duke game was kind of the exception. I think they were up by 10 at halftime of that one, but um, you know, I had to come back to beat LSU and uh, did some of those those things. And, and then, then you watch and you just see the, the, the kind of team performance that it really was um, where you get unsuspected contributions from guys like Isle and Hillman. Uh, Smart had an okay, you know, a solid first half, but you know what he would eventually, you know, just take over in the national championship game. So, um, just just fun with this team to watch different guys step up in different moments uh, throughout their tournament run, and uh, you know the play of Alford was a, a pretty steadying force throughout. But uh, the guys around him that really stepped up in different moments were uh, were were cool to watch. And so uh, yeah, it, it has definitely been enjoyable. I think you are on again with me for the '87 championship game. So we'll uh, hold whatever thoughts we have about the the context of this and the seasons to come uh, until then. But uh, I don't even need to fun... watch that game. I can just do it I, memory. I, so yeah, I was gonna say yeah. The, the, it's been funny because I was trying to go through for some of these and like this one, this one was difficult. But I, you know, typically I'll like chart some of the possessions for the other games. And so I was trying to do that. And this one, this one was difficult. I would look down to type something into the computer. And I'd look up and you know he was already jacking up a three. Yeah. Um, so there, I don't think there were too many holes in what I ended up having, but it didn't allow a lot of time to actually uh, actually analyze what was there. But there was a stretch in the second half where IU was just absolutely on fire uh offensively i think they scored on maybe 15 out of 18 possessions or something like that where it was just i mean they were just a machine and they had actually you know had slowed down a lot they had a really good start to the second half and iu slowed them down so it's kind of fun to to watch through it with some of the you know more modern statistical things or the ways that i watch games now and going back to some of the old games and watching them that way again um uh, so always different layers no matter how many times you watch these and, and different things that you pick up on and uh, and all that. So it has definitely been enjoyable. So, uh, any other, any other thoughts on a Ryan had to drop off and I know it's getting a little bit uh, late where you and I are, and I think we're already at close to the hour and a half mark, but what else, what else do people have to, to listen to? So any other kind of lingering thoughts from the, uh, or from the game, uh, that you wanted to hit on that we didn't get a chance to do before? You know, it just, I, I will say that, you know, there's, there's little moments that, and maybe this is the lack of score or lack of time, but there's there's moments where UNLV swings into the lead and you're like, oh, I wasn't that didn't know that it was that close. And then I use swings back ahead by seven or eight. I remember Alford in his book referred to this as just like really intense, but really fun basketball for 40 minutes. You know, it was, it was very much a player's sort of game uh, in, in a way that you didn't always see because Knight loved to control the 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 way the game was played. And so it, it's fun. This is one of those where like. IU's players got a chance to, to just kind of go out and play, not playground ball because they were far more disciplined than that. But but the closest you were going to see IU play to like a playground style, and so that was fun to watch. And uh, yeah, just overall, I mean, the, the everything about the the broadcast uh, is is just so nostalgic. I think that's the that's the other thing that I keep coming back to. The colors are muted in that '80s sort of style, and the graphics are huge, and they're all like you know like really ridiculous colors uh it's just a, the the whole package is is neat to go back and watch it's a, it's a really awesome time capsule even without the commercials yeah the the james brown interview of the people sitting up at the top what was the what was the quote the game so, is a the game up here is nothing but a rumor yeah it's <laughs> tremendous uh well you see because as you mentioned you're 27 or 28 stories above the court and you know this was back in an era when you know you're sticking the 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 court in the middle of the football field and then you've got stands around it and then you've got the upper deck and it's uh it's not a great venue and none of those domes are particularly great venues when they've got it like that as opposed to what they would end up doing later where they'd cut off half the seating section but they'd move the court next to the uh to the main seating section and so that would make it a little bit closer for everybody i remember i was at the 
I went to the 2000 final four when it was at the RCA dome and we had tickets way the heck up in the upper deck, kind of like where James Brown was at. And I was like, this sucks. This is terrible. Like this is a terrible (laughs) angle. You can't see anything. Uh, The replays aren't even that great. So I, I empathize with those people, but it was a nice shot. I felt bad for James Brown that he had to climb all the way up to the 600 level to get that. <laughs> yeah, I, I would agree. Yeah, that's always a fun part to go back and, and see. Yeah, the game up here is nothing, could be nothing more than a rumor. But I will, one other thing I was, and someone mentioned Tarkanian in the, in the, uh, in the chat. It's interesting because this UNLV team had been to the Final Four once before. They went 10 years earlier in 1977. That was that weird Final Four uh, when Marquette was in it and um and north carolina was in it and you know they've been a solid to pretty good program but i think the most of the, the furthest they've gotten i think they went to one elite eight sometime in the early to mid 80s and so this was i think to some degree tarkanian is looking at and he's like i don't know if i'm going to be able to like get this team over the line uh and then of course they would have that tremendous team a few years later but that that was a program that i feel like they were just everybody assumed they were corrupt at the time and they ended up being like the, all of the ills of college basketball was UNLV, you know, despite the fact Kentucky's, you know, a couple hours down the road. <laughs> um, and yet, you know, I feel like it overshadows how I mean, that was a really, that was a really important program in the, the evolution. Like, I feel like to some degree, they have like the fab five and, and some of the stuff that happened in the early nineties ended up really overshadowing how good of a program that UNLV program was. And and it's easy to see why when you watch a game like this. Yeah, it just was, to go back to what you said about Alford, just like a really enjoyable game. I mean, it was, I, I think some of these older games do not age well just in terms of the, not necessarily the quality of play. I think they get a bad rap. People look at the score and say, oh, this couldn't have been a well-played game versus this one. I mean, for a 97 to 93 game to be played in that era was, uh, definitely not the norm, but it was, you know, you know, he didn't take some great shots, but they played the way that they wanted to play in large part. I mean, that was their style. So it, while that wasn't necessarily mainstream by any means at that point, like they were playing the style that they wanted to play, but really pounded the offensive glass and kind of made up for maybe taking bad shots by, uh, by doing that and, and pressuring. And I, you gave up a few easy baskets off of steals, but generally even with 14 turnovers or whatever it was, not a ton of those led immediately to um, to points, but, you know, in IU, the same thing. The offense was just so fun to watch and so efficient. Um, and, and as we talked about, would pass up a, a good shot to get a better shot. Um, and it really did, you know, just in terms of the overall gameplay and how competitive it was, but also how free-flowing it was. And, and, um, and it was just a fun game of basketball to kind of sit back and, and watch, despite the fact there were a boatload, I think close to 50 fouls in total that slowed things down a little bit. Um, but even with all that, it was still just an enjoyable watch uh, in a way that some games from you know around that time w- wouldn't necessarily be. I would also like to note for the one or two UNLV fans that have hate listened to this entire podcast and who continue to haunt the YouTube uh, comment section of this game, <laughs> Uh, the officials were not biased against UNLV in this game. The foul totals were 26 for UNLV, 23 for Indiana. So I think it's it's time to get off that horse, guys. Let's let's just let's just uh, let's find another thing to blame the loss on here. All right. There we go. Yeah, because even yeah, and they and they fouled a few times at the end to put IU on the line. So really, up to that point, it was it was relatively even. But uh, anyway, so all right. Well, I I will uh, I think we'll wrap it up from there. Uh, Galen, uh, thanks again for joining us for these. Thanks again for, uh, for recording it and, uh, and, and doing all that and, and preserving it for everyone. There's a lot of other, for those who haven't looked and are, uh, either when we're done with this or between this and the next one, uh, looking for other things to watch. Galen has a lot of great stuff out there. It's got some old IU football games. I, uh, still mean to go back and watch the Liberty Bowl uh, that I was in attendance for freezing, uh, <laughs> freezing to death, but, uh, uh, that was a, that was a fun one. So lots of good stuff out there. If you want to watch more games of this team or, uh, or of others would definitely encourage you to, everybody to go out and, uh, and check that out. And then, uh, I think as we mentioned before, they're, they're doing some good hypothetical, uh, questions they're answering over at, uh, Crimson Cast, as well as the Bloomington restaurant, uh, uh, podcast long awaited. Uh, I've only been, 
a, a fly on the wall for a couple of these. So it was uh, even for me was was long anticipated, and the first episode did not disappoint. So <laughs> I look forward to future ones, and uh, certainly have plenty of time without sports to watch or other things well, to we got, to we listen. So one, keep churning them out. Another one coming soon. Don't worry. Thanks for having awesome. me on, Andy. This awesome. Is great. All right. Well, thanks, everybody, for joining us. Uh, We'll be back on Sunday for 1976 IU Michigan National Championship. And uh, again, thanks, everybody, for joining us for these. And uh, we will talk again soon. Thanks, everybody. All right. Appreciate it. Thank you, as always. Mm -hmm. A pleasure. All right. We will uh, talk to you soon. Take care. Take it easy. Bye. All right. Bye.